Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Chiam, and I'm Assistant Professor of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Western Carolina University. Our course of business focuses on providing high quality education to prepare business ready graduates. I believe earning certification is a great value and benefit for students. The International Hospitality Institute offers many great training and certification to hospitality professionals and students. I went through the Certified Hotel mm -hmm. General Manager Certification and Certified Digital Marketing Director Certification. This program is online and self-paced. They are informative courses. I would recommend this program to hospitality professionals and students who are looking to upskill or reskill themselves in the field of hospitality. Thank you, International Hospitality Institute, for the great certifications. Um, good morning or afternoon. Not sure where everybody is. Um, it's 8.30 in the morning for me. So hope everyone is doing well. Brendan, you look thrilled. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Hold on. I'm just get my notes going here. All right. All right. Um, well, Suzanne, I'll give you a chance to just kind of introduce yourself to the gang um, since you weren't able to make our little pre-con. Thanks for having me, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor. I'm Suzanne Bagnera, and I'm the director of the Hospitality Institute at Indian River State College down in the Treasure Coast of Florida. Mm -hmm. I've come with upwards of 17 years of teaching experience in the hospitality industry and um, over two decades of experience in the hospitality field in both restaurants and hotels uh, with the culmination of being a general manager. I also serve as the executive producer for the No Vacancy News podcast, the number one podcast with Anthony Malkiri and Glenn Hausman. I'm thrilled to be here with us today. Okay, and uh, we'll go down. Uh, Ethan, we saw your nice video, but uh, we'll let you do it again. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, thanks for the invitation to join this panel discussion. My name is Ethan Chen, and I'm currently Assistant Professor of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Western Carolina University. And I met Susan before, and good to meet with Kelvin and Brandon. And I look forward to have a great discussion with you all. Absolutely. All right, and then Brandon? You're still on mute, don't forget. You're still on, on mute, Brendan. Unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. It's, no uh, my, name, my name is Brendan Dugan. I, uh, it's fairly early in the morning here in Western Australia. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a great privilege to be able to talk with uh, some esteemed uh, colleagues and let's have some fun. Yeah, absolutely. And finally, I'm Calvin Taloki. I'll be the moderator of the panel today. Um, you all may know me as Ref Problems on Instagram. I have actually been on No Vacancy a couple of times, so that was a, a great time, great show. Um, what I do now is I focus on um, brand management for, for hospitality companies uh, through my media company, Ref Par Media. Um, so today, what we're going to be talking about is hospitality training and trends. Um, well, we had a, a great uh, pre-show here for you guys, so we come up with some with some really insightful questions to to kind of go over and talk about uh, what's happening in the industry, how we can do better with uh, what opportunities we have with with training um, of our staff. So uh, we'll just kick it off. First question we have today is: um, we, we feel like we're seeing a decline in customer service in the hospitality industry, and um, I felt like I, I feel I've seen that for quite some time, actually. And um, the question to the panel is, how much of a role does training play in this trend that we're seeing? Well, Ethan, what was, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, jump in. Yeah, if, if you don't mind me sort of jumping in, I, I believe uh, training is absolutely crucial. It's, you know, I agree with you. A lot of people are turning around and saying, due to the pandemic, uh, this, is, this is what's caused it. But 
it's been going on for a lot longer. We we haven't been as a as an industry looking after our uh, staff in any way which is uh, conducive to them staying, and we, we we haven't built on their on their capacities. You know, we've just sort of put them in, whether it be front of house, back of house, in, in whatever role, just sort of put them in and let you know. Sometimes it's sink or swim attitude. Um, you know, and you know, I know we're going to be covering it a little bit later, but it doesn't matter whether you're in the hotels or independence. Uh, you, you you really need to encourage your, your staff not only to inc- to increase the customer service, but it, it relates to your bottom line. And we're not doing that uh, in any way. You know, there, there there are pockets of the industry here in in Australia that are doing it well, and you can see that in their results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Ethan, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I believe training is very important, definitely. Um, but uh, during Kobe, I would say we can focus more on probably um, like how to face stress. Uh, probably there will be like mental health issue. I think that will be important. Not just telling, you know, the, how to service. I believe that how you do to someone and provide great service, that's very general uh, training. But I also think about like the hospitality, like how you can make someone feel. That is also a very important part to make a unique experience for customers. Um, so from the educational perspective, uh, we have those like capstone course, internship course. I mean, those are help them to build practical knowledge. And I believe that's a way that before we enter industry, we can help students to be a business ready graduate. So uh, they can build knowledge and skills experience at school and learn how to serve the world before they enter industry. Um, and also I think uh, we should have more the communication, connection with the industry and education. So we know like how we can help students to fit the owners or managers their needs, like training needs. Like, you know, we can only prepare them to be ready. Um, so I also think about, we can think about to evaluate the training outcome, um, the effectiveness. I think sometimes we just think about, oh, that's important, but does the training really fit with the young people they they like? Sometimes they feel bored. Maybe we can insert some like technology use in training, like VR, like have some like, gamif- gamification, the idea into a VR program. So change the style of the training, probably will have better uh, training outcomes for young people who want to join uh, the hospitality industry. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. I think, you know, kind of customizing the training to a newer, younger generation that, that is coming into the workforce is, is a great point. Um, Suzanne? I would say that I feel like we've been on autopilot prior to COVID and the fact that many times we would just bring folks on, uh, we might train them right to get started. And then that was kind of it. We just kind of abandoned folks. And so I think that opportunity where we need to have the right hire to start and then really work on properly onboarding them in that training process so that we're creating this culture and this enjoyment for wanting to be there. I think that's going to leverage ourselves much further as an industry, not just the niche of the individual business, but that culture and that constant training and that support that we can give our associates is really going to be the key to driving up that customer service and keeping that up and keeping our staff members motivated to want to continue to deliver that outstanding experience that our guests have become accustomed to and are truly expecting. And so there's so many different ways that we can do that. I know we're gonna talk about some of those, but uh, I'm really hoping that we can collectively rethink how do we leverage ourselves and invest the time that we need to in training to make better associates, which would then deliver much better customer service. Yeah, yeah, Suzanne, you made a great point. Um, I, I think, uh, I think a lot of people are trying to blame COVID and blame the, the pandemic for a lot of these issues when they were they were there for a long time. I think uh, you know I, I like to say COVID kind of came and just wipe our slate clean and expose a lot of the issues we've already had. They've been there. Um, I always like to say I've I can count on two fingers the amount of hotels that I worked at where I got a proper onboarding ex- experience, and one of those I was already a director. You know, so I kind of had a, 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 a knowledge of how the industry works, you know, um, 
as as you said, you know, we tend to kind of throw people in um, because we're under fire. We we need you know we 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 need to fill positions, and you know we're always short staffed. But the reason we're always short staffed is because we're not training people properly. We we bring them in, we throw them at entry level positions. They don't really understand how their role pertains to the entire operation. Then. I mean, hospitality is a beast. Okay, we're open twenty four seven, and you know we deal with the we deal with the public, especially if you're talking about front desk and other guest facing positions, and dealing with all of that without having a vision of where this may take you, is 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 a recipe for disaster. And then we wonder why every six to eight months we're replacing these people, you know. So having that training is 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 critical. Um, so that kind of leads me into question number two. Do we feel that there should be, or is there a difference between training for independent uh, or branded hotels and restaurants? We can go in the same order. So Brendan, if you want to jump in on that. Yeah. Um, simply because of uh, sometimes the resources available hotels do tend to have a little bit more of a onboarding or a training program in place. Independents tend to expect, uh, you know, their, their new employees to already have the skills in place. You know, I'm in the uh, VT or the uh, vocational education system. And, you know, I get uh, employees all employers all the time saying, you know, we need people, we need people, we need people. And I go, yeah, not a problem. But they, they ex their expectations of these people is uh, out of whack with uh, what we can produce. You know, we, we have them for a very short period of time. And because of the shortages that are around, and, you know, this has been going on for five or ten years down here, um, you know, th they get jobs far, far too early in their uh, development. And as soon as they get their job, they're getting their money. Their, their need for training is, you know, they believe, no, I've got my job. I don't need to be trained anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, you know, sometimes we're promoting beyond their capabilities. And then simply because they've been in, a, been in the organization for two, three years, whether it be a small little restaurant, you know, neighborhood restaurant, because they're known, they go, okay, here's, here's the keys. You can be the manager. They've got no management. They've got no management experience whatsoever. They're, all they've got is that they've got two years in, um, and so it's a bit of a cycle. And then uh, with the hotels, at least you've got some. You've got a little bit more of a, a pathway. Um, but then you see, you know, I speak to a lot of uh, young people, and they sort of think, oh well, hotels. You know, it's going to take me too long to get there. If I go into a little, small little uh, independent, I, I can do. I can be there a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, uh, the generation these days, they, they want it possibly before they're, they're due. They're, you, know, um, you know, good luck to them. You know, I, I, when I first started 35, 40 years ago, I, I didn't get it as quickly as uh, some of these guys these days. But, um, you know, I had to do the hard yards. Uh, and then what I did was I did the opposite. I, I did my training after I've been in the organizations for, you know, in or been in the industry for at least 10, 15 years. Then I was doing more, more of the training. But it, was it planned? No, I was planned by me. Uh, and I was fortunate that I had the support that, uh, especially from my wife, that turned around and said, you know, look, you know, go off and do. And I was putting myself through courses, not a planned thing at all. Right. Right. I, I think, yeah, I, I think that's a great point that you're touching on. I know we'll get into it in further questions, but, you know, you need to be proactive about your own training, you know, as, as the associate as well. I mean, onboarding is, is, is on the, the responsibility of, of the employer, you know, to get you set up uh, correctly. But if you want to make those next steps and move up, uh, you know, up, up into management and, and other levels, you need to be proactive about that. So I, that's a great point. Um, Ethan, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, from my previous work experience in both independent or branded hotels, I do think when I work in a independent hotels, I I kind of see that the owners or GM looks like my role model, and I follow them so much to you know learn, no matter the style, the attitude, the work behavior. Uh, in the branded hotels, I think those training I think it's more systematic. 
um, mm. and a step by step. So, and I have more chance to go to learn from those peers or department heads. Uh, so we have more like horizontal and vertical communication uh, in the brand new hotel. But on the other hand, for independent hotels, whenever I may need some further needs, training needs, uh, the owners, I can talk with them and then they are willing to support. So it's kind of a um, somewhat different, but I would say very similar because uh, finally I get what I need to learn and I can perform well. Uh, but just some different timelines or the budget. Yeah, yeah, that's that's also that's also a really good point. I know with branded hotels, a lot of them you have these um, these extra nets where you can go on. And I've worked for Marriott and Hilton and a few of the larger brands. You can just go on and pretty much get almost any training that you need, whether it be on the systems or or um, different things like that. So there, there's it certainly is a huge benefit you know, to the brand for the exposure to how much training you can get, but that personal touch you get at uh, independent property, I, I think is critical. So you can learn better that way. Um, Suzanne? From my experience and having actually worked in both um, branded properties, corporately managed properties, uh, franchise properties, and independents, I have found that the standards that are in place for branded properties is gonna somewhat foster a little bit more of a push for your training because there's typically a requirement, a mandate. There's a timeline that's gonna be associated with when you have to go through those experiences. And some of those may be either um, at the corporate office or the headquarters, others may be something that is regional. And then there has been this proliferation of an online component to continue to support that learning. However, like some of the comments I'm seeing, I completely agree that online experience is very different. You need some of that face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to really you know, feel that fostering and that connection. I still, to this day, have a great connection with my uh, regional and corporate trainer from when I was within Holiday Inn, just having done a fabulous job. Now, with the independents, they don't necessarily have that support like the brands do. And so they really need to be working with their local lodging or restaurant association, what are they putting forward for training opportunities and workshops that are there? Um, what leveraged partnerships do they have with local trainers in the area to support? Because one of the things that I have found is not all independents are great at training. They may be great at the task of what they have to do to run their position in their hotel, but the skill set to deliver training is not something that is the best for them. So identifying a uh, local or regional or even an international partner that can deliver training services to be able to support your growth of your employees really become. All right, I think uh, Suzanne got a little frozen there, but we, I think we, we got the gist of, of that response, which is, um, which is a, a great point. I'm going to jump into one of the questions we have here, actually, in the in the Q and A, um, as it ties into something we wanted to talk about. Uh, and Darren asks, should our training and onboarding processes be used as a tool for recruiting, um, if the processes are where they need to be? Uh, what do you think on that, Brendan? I'll let you start off. Um. Yeah. Uh... The yeah, you jumped a question on me. I was I was prepared for the next question, but uh, no, me... yeah, sorry. Yes, this is one, one. This is one from the audience. So I figured let's let's get the audience involved as well. Okay, all right. So yeah, the, the hiring crisis. Yeah, there is a crisis, and and I've been doing some research over the last couple of months, and it is uh, it is not just in my little pocket of the world. It's uh, it's worldwide and. Um, yeah, what, what can we do better? Yeah, definitely onboarding, uh, you know, but you know, we need to look at the, the whole hiring process and get the right people for the job. You know, I'm, I'm concerned with the, a lot of the, uh, things that I'm reading about how you have to have a certain amount of, uh, 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 inclusivity, and I, I'm, I'm all for it, but you've got to have the right people for the right roles. And sometimes we're, we're, we're not doing that. We're, we're putting a, we're trying to put a, a round into a square and it doesn't fit, you know, and uh, 
don't don't just sort of make rules to make sure that we're 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 seen to be doing the right thing politically or whatever. Do the right thing by the business, and all of a sudden you you will have the uh, customer service and all the uh, other things working, so that your organisation is much better prepared. Uh, and don't just do the onboarding for the first day, two days, or three days. You know, it should be an on, ongoing thing. And uh, and this is where you're going to get the right people. If you, when you're doing the hiring, let them know this is this is where we're going to be doing. This is what we're going to be doing. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you, you've got people that are coming into your organisation ready to take on all the different uh, challenges that you're going to be giving to them. Yeah, yeah. That's the, yeah. That's that's a great point. I think you know the 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 point about hiring hiring the the right people. Um, you know, if you have if if people have the skills, then give them a chance. You know, this is something that uh, I'll be talking about later in the luxury segment. But one issue that that you tend to see is a lot of time hiring managers are way too stuck on everybody needed to tick every single box, right? And you know, we're in a in a situation where we are now. With with a hiring crisis and struggling to to fill roles, I think if you if somebody has the basic skills of a position, whether that be revenue management or sales or marketing or operations, they've done a lot of the things you need them to do. Be willing to train. That's where we're dropping the ball. You know, to we we've seen so many issues where people oh must have Hilton experience, must have Marriott experience. What that tells you is that these people are not willing to train. They're not going to train you on the system. They're not going to invest the time to train you in on on those on those systems. That's our fault as as a hiring as the industry. That's that's on that's that's on you now. Because if this person has the skills to do this job, but you won't train them how to use the system, that's your fault. Yep. All right. So uh, moving on, let's uh, get uh, Ethan. We'll let you jump in here. Yeah, I definitely think um, training could be used for recruitment. I already saw many companies they use that way, not just talk about the benefits or, you know, I, I believe young people, they also want to know more about a career advancement, uh, leadership opportunity. So um, definitely that's a way and they can see and reduce the job insecurity, more confident about working in the hospitality industry and more know. Uh, understand about like how they're going to learn and tra- I mean, be trained and to perform well. So um, I would like to say more flyers or even the job description, we can see that, um, you know, it could be uh, during an interview, they can talk about those as a way to attract job applicants. Um, so I do think that's important uh, for could be using in the recruiting process. Yeah, absolutely. Suzanne? Sorry for blipping out. Apparently we have internet issues still in these days. You'd figure that would be solved after all of this. Um, But I would say from, um, you know, really agreeing in terms of having your job description be specific to the skills that you're needing, not necessarily to the specifics of your company. So that's what you're looking for. And to be honest, uh, one of the strategies that I had as a general manager, and I still consider it relevant and I still teach my students to this day, I would much rather hire someone with that sparkle. For those of you that are my my Bristol friends that are out there, um, really looking that I'm hiring for that attitude. I can work on training you those additional skills that are needed, but I can't train you to genuinely smile and have that sense of inner passion for our industry. And so again, this is where you've got to get creative with, if you have these skills and you need to go deeper, What can you do? What resources are available in your organization? If you don't have the time personally to invest in that training, what workshops can you make uh, available to your associates? What local opportunities exist? Now's the best time if there is ever a time to partner with your local college or your local community college to create workshops or even do tuition reimbursement opportunities to take classes to strengthen some of those additional skills that need to be developed by those associates that you may not have time to invest on, but can be a little bit more general in in developing that associate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We just had a a great comment here. So I'm gonna bring this one to the table and we can talk about from Michaela. Uh, As an applicant, there needs to be a way to get those people to the interview. How do we know they'll be a great employee if we won't give them an interview? And I 
I won't put any words in your mouth, but I, I think that's kind of what we're saying here, right? Is is we need to be open minded, you know. As I said before, we all have a, a criteria for employees that we're looking for, but do they need to tick every single box, right? You, you know, yeah. if 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 these people are showing that they have the ability and the and some of the experience that we need, be willing to to bring them in and find out if they have that sparkle, if they have the attitude, if they have that right to give them a call. Right. You know, we've historically and this is my opinion, but historically we've been too quick to move past people if, if they if their resume doesn't look right, if they don't fit what we're looking for. And maybe when we had plenty of staff and, and things were, were, were rolling along, we had the ability to do that. We no longer have that 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 option. Right. We don't have that luxury of being able to just throw resumes out because they don't look right. Um, you know, if you know, people, we, we, we can't fill positions, we might need to start changing the thinking. So Michaela, I think that's kind of what, what we're, we're getting at there. Um, so we've I'm just going to add go to that. I think in the interview process, this is where if you've got some of these skills that are really important that you need these candidates to have, make sure you've crafted good behavioral interview questions so that even though it may not be specific examples to what you're looking for, for your for your area, you can dig a little bit deeper into do they have that past experience because that's a, a good indicator of future performance, at least if you can target in on those skills to ask about in that interview process. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And you know, you, actually you just reminded me of something I went through um, about a year ago. I was interviewing for for a, a revenue position and the GM started asking me, he's like, well, you know, do you uh, do you play cards? And I'm like, no. Like, well, do you, do you gamble or anything? I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking, you know, and I couldn't get, and it took a second. And when I realized, I know what he's trying to get at. He wants to know how much I'm into statistics and analytics. So I was like, I play fantasy football. I think I know what you're getting at. And then, and then we, we clicked because that's all about like in my spare time, do I still use, utilize those skills of, you know, trends and analysis and how do I do that in, in, in a, in a more fun, fun way. So I guess he wanted to know how into uh, st uh, statistics I was, but I couldn't get it for a second. I'm like, poker, I'm like, what are we talking about here? Um, so we're, we're talking about things from the employee standpoint. So I want to now pivot a little bit onto the, um, on the associate, right? So a lot of entry-level employees are entering the workforce without basic skills like presentations, how to interview properly, how to properly put together their resume, how to use Excel um, and other, you know, Microsoft Word uh, type of uh, systems. Should it be our responsibility as the employers to, to train on all these aspects? I, I, I don't believe it's uh, the, necessarily the employer's responsibility. I think, you know, the employer will be getting them afterwards. I think, it, you know, I, I'm a bit of a believer, possibly I've covered it already, that it's, it's up to the associate to start planning and getting themselves ready. Uh, yes, there's, there's lots of courses, both online and face-to-face -face, that you can do these days um, that can develop those skills. You know, and you've got to be able to want to do them uh, and then get out there and, and, and practice them. Um, I know with my students, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot of uh, a lot of students these days, they're fantastic with technology, absolutely fantastic. But get them to stand up in front of even four people like you would in a, a restaurant situation and they, they fall to pieces. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't got those, those that face-to-face -face confidence to be able to talk. And you sort of go, this, this is still hospitality uh, and we, we are still a, uh, a human workforce uh you know robots will be coming we know that but at the present present moment in time we need that uh people skills and when we're not we're not doing it well both as an employer and also as a as an associate before we become an employee yeah agreed ethan yeah so even in 2021, I still got many feedback from owners, GMs. They talk about student lack of the, those, some uh, basic skills. They are good at um, soft skills, people skills, 
But in order to be more professional, I think uh, that is what higher education we can help. So in order, in, instead of just learning like management, marketing, human resource, finance, uh, now we also offer about like teaching them how to prepare resume, um, to prepare interview, like how to answer those questions. Like we just mentioned the behavioral questions to look at your past behavior, but also like situational question for some people, we can also ask them, give them some scenario and ask them to what you will do to meet the cost needs or how you handle the cost complaint. That is also a way you can understand the job candidate. So, um, I would say learning how to write resume, how to prepare interview, and also how to do a PowerPoints. Like, you know, you're not just copy and paste the content, but you know, you can make some animation, make some more attractive. I think those are way, if you're working in a revenue management marketing, you definitely need to do some presentation to show analysis, the result. And I would say that would be very important big skills. And sometimes I, I still student, they know, how to run analysis, they know how to present, but they just don't know how to do, uh, you know, create a good PowerPoint slides. And I think that we can help from higher education perspective. I also think on the other hand, um, I also see some lack of knowledge and skills for HR staff in the large industry. Like they may create a job description and it's like five page, six pages, but you know, sometimes those candidates just lost their concentration they don't know what are the important job functions important specifications and you also need to consider about how we can train those employees to prepare a good job description and specifications so i do think from both sides we can improve from their uh, basic skills and also hr skills especially for creating a job description and follow up with those job interview questions based on the specification or descriptions yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, and that's something we'll get into in our next question. But there is opportunity on the on the manager side and the hiring side for um, for making this work. Um, I'll, I'll let you get in there, Suzanne. I would say here's a great opportunity from where you are locally to work with your higher education institutes, get on their advisory boards. And not just on the higher education side, but also in the high school end. High schools are clamoring for the advisor as well for specific programs. And here, look at what are those skills and help collaboratively come up with ways in which that can be infused into the curriculum. And then essentially partner together where you will look at hiring opportunities with these students that are coming out of the program, but continue. And this is where my big push in terms of bridging the gap has to occur. As the employers, if you are looking for people with these skills, while you might not have to do the actual training to them, you've got to invest your time in trying to build a better pipeline of people so that you get candidates that are going to better meet your needs. And if you're not investing some of that time into your local community to try and capture those people, you're going to be frustrated in the end. So you've got to reshift, repivot, and really think about how you can collaboratively work together to get what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I, I think, I think uh, you know, Ethan and Suzanne, you hit it on the head. This has to, things like interview skills, resume, that has to be at the, the high school university level. I think once you're looking to enter the workforce, that part of it is not really on on the on the hiring manager. You need to come prepared for that. I always said my, you know, the most important class when I was in college was one called professional development, where we did mock interviews, we learned all of these skills, and we we'd have people come in to actually interview us um, for internships and things like that. Where's where you learn all that stuff? It, that has to be done in uh, at the university level. But to Brendan's point, I think when you um, once you once you're there. We do, I think, when it comes to things like uh, presenting, right? Like as, as Brendan mentioned, when, you're, when you know you want to move up to another level, you may want to become a manager, you're going to have to run staff meetings. You know, as a, as a revenue manager, I ran revenue meetings. When I was ready to make that step, I asked my director for opportunities to start running these on a smaller level. So I got used to presenting and I got used to speaking in front of people and knowing how to disseminate this information properly. So once you get in the workforce, it's up to you to raise your hand and find somebody or find an opportunity to learn those skills. Um, which kind of brings me into our, our next question is, um, training for managers in hospitality is also important. Uh, things like 
performance reviews are not the, not things that any of us have maybe really been trained on. Um, how do we bridge that gap of, of, of preparing our managers in the industry to give pro- performance reviews to these associates moving up? Again, uh, if I could just go back to uh, Suzanne's point, the partnerships is extremely important. Uh, she was talking about the partnerships with community. That's where you're going to get your future employees. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to mention that, you know, I fully agree with that. And where I am at uh, the college, we we actively go out and we work with uh, industry continually. We're, we're encouraged to be there. So if you've got those relationships, then you're going to get the, the better people coming to your organisation. But as for the managers, yes, again, we, we need to have a training program in place and, you know, sometimes it's best to get an outside voice to come in, get the professionals who, who are trained in performance appraisals, that sort of thing, get them in to train your future managers, have a look at your training needs analysis, pinpoint who you think might be going forward, put it out to the people who wants to go into this training. Because if, if they put their hand up that they want to be trained, they, they've already got their uh, commitment. So it, it would be so much easier going forward that uh, they, will, they, will, they will take it on board, they will, they will listen, they will learn. And if they've got their skills training, then all of a sudden they're going to be able to pass that skill on to the next generation or the next people coming through. You always want to be, you know, when I was in senior management, I always had, my idea was always to have this, my second in charge being better than me. Uh, so, you know, as soon as, as soon as I left, I expected them to be offered the job, possibly before I'd even walked out the door. Um, but you only do that if you've got a good training base in mind. Um, and, you know, what happens is we, we start panicking or oh, someone's leaving, people are always going to be leaving. So you've got to be planning for that prior to, not after they've already handed in their paperwork. Yeah, great point, great point. Ethan? I personally think that I think there are some uh, online training certifications that will be great for managers to, you know, to learn, especially like on extra scales. Uh, I also think that it may sound the association or groups of like the managers, they can, you know, talk and have some discussion about how they can lead or, you know, the, their team. Mentor, mentorship program, I think that's also a way you can have some senior faculty to, uh, not faculty, senior staff um, to guide those uh, uh, junior uh, staff. So it will help them to help them to prepare, uh, be a greater uh, manager. Uh, so I think those are a way we can use or have some more uh, orientations for each department or training. Uh, I do think that is a way, especially like bigger hotel, you know, at different departments, then we can show about like some skills that we can share with each other too. Uh, it says we're interview recruitment process. So they know more about like how they can find the Mr. Right or Miss Right. So, and also collaboration between educators and hotelers, or I think that would be a way um, to improve uh, their skills of the managers. Yeah. So one of the things that I've always done when I was in that role, I created PDPs, personal development plans. Mm. And so this was my strategy, again, coming from a Bristol um, hierarchy, and I loved it, was that we would create plans to say, where do you want to go as an associate? Where do you want to rise to in this company? And let's develop that plan to get you there. We might not have all the training tools in-house. Maybe there will be something online. Maybe we need to find something externally. There could be mentorship opportunities, shadowing opportunities. But if you have a goal to where you want to go, let's work collaboratively to get you there to that goal and figure out what are the skills for that position that's necessary and then put that plan into place. Your industry partnerships, your collaboration with your local higher education institutes, um, for, the, for the record on the side, I also do hospitality customer service training. Hospitality Leadership Academy is something myself and my principals run um, as a great opportunity to provide that type of training. Additionally, one new thing that you might be hearing about soon, uh, 
certifications, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to cut to that chase for us, Calvin, um, mm -hmm. is the fact that I will be creating with the television series host, Anthony Malcuri, the Anthony Malcuri Institute of Hospitality, which will be powered by Indian River State College and the Trevor, Treasure Coast of Florida. And from that vantage point, we can provide a lot of this type of certification opportunity to help leverage your employees to get to that next level. I encourage you to connect with me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So yeah, uh, we have maybe just three minutes here left. So want to jump into our last question. Um, what steps can we take to improve work conditions as it relates to stress? Yeah, I, in, I'm not sure if this is uh, the case in other parts of the world, but we have uh, probably the last four or five years have a have something called Are You OK? Just those four letters, Are You OK? And it's amazing how many times uh, I've been asked, even by some of my students, other colleagues, are you okay? And it's becoming a lot more uh, accepted that you, you can turn around and say, no, I'm having a bad one. You know, too many times we were expected to just sort of put up with everything. Now it's, it's becoming uh, more the norm that you can turn around and say, no, I'm having a bad day. I encourage uh you know, people in, in industry, I, I encourage them to turn around and say, look, if you're having a bad day, don't don't put it on everybody else. If you if you can't can't sort of uh, put on the performance for for example, for the public, then don't go in. Don't don't, you know, because what happens is they, they're coming in with uh, possibly mental stress and these sort of things, and it's it's showing in their work performance. So then we're sort of going, well. Uh, customer service is going down. Yeah, because there's there's so many other factors that may be in, in case in there. Uh, you know, yes, at the present moment in time, everybody's got some mental stress. It's, it's not, you know, if, if we don't believe that, then we're, we've got our head in the sand. We have to realise that everybody's got some, some levels of stress. It's how they're coping with it. And then, as I said, just those four letters, are you okay? It's, it's, uh, they're quite powerful. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right, Ethan, uh, I'll give you a couple seconds here. Yes. I would say managed program, mental health program. Those are very, I think a good idea too. really is, um, job stress, no matter mental, physical stress. I uh, can get some, uh, supervisor or colleagues for, I think that is a way, uh, use some technology, like social media I use at work. I do think that's a way or the uh, break activities at work. And sometimes owner may think that is kind of, a, you know, a waste of your time. And, but I would say um, probably could be like some text, some watch some short video during work. I mean, that short activity actually can make people feel much better, relax, refresh, recover from work stress. So I do think um, this could be the way to release the stress. Yeah, that's absolutely a, a, a five minute break, even if it's not scheduled, isn't going to hurt anybody. I would say create a culture of support and back up what you preach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'll, I'll finish. I'll wrap up with a really quick story because this is this conversation just reminded me. Um, I worked at a hotel once where. We were short staff at the front desk as, as usual. And we, we had one person scheduled on a Sunday, one, one front desk associate. And it wasn't a huge hotel, but it was maybe 130 checkouts. That's a lot of people. I don't care, you know, what it, one person handling 130, you know, departures is a lot. And um, the, the general manager was looped in to a, a, a conversation about, hey, this person is kind of in the weeds right now. Um, and their response was, yeah, she's in a rough spot. And then we came to find out that the general manager was out, you know, having drinks. You know, he posted on his Instagram that he was out having drinks that day. And it's like things like that are why people get burnt out, stressed out and leave. Right. It, what would it have taken for you to jump in? And, and I should put the caveat, the general manager lived about eight minutes from the property. So it wasn't like, you know, the person needed to commute an hour to get there, but just being present, even if nobody expects your GM to know how to check in and check out people, but be present in the lobby, help with the line, just kind of chat people up and say, hey, listen, you know, we have express checkout, you don't necessarily need to sit by the desk, but just that associate, just seeing 
another person there to support would have gone a long way. And even if you just man the desk for 10 minutes, give you know him or her a break, these are the type of things that that really bombard people and make our job already stressful job even more so. Um, so you know, like you said, having that culture of support and uh, in, in, in being there for your people. Um, but we are out of time. I, I knew we would uh, fill up this this 45 minutes really quickly. We had more to get to, but um, you know, great insight from everybody here great comments uh, from, from the audience. And um, I don't know what the next step is. I know I'm, I'm on an, another panel in about 15 minutes. So if you're not sick of hearing me talk yet, you can tune into that one. But thank you to my uh, esteemed panel. It was great to chat with you guys. Um, I hope to do something else with you in the future. And um, I hope we gave you some, some great insight out there in the audience on training. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Great yeah. to see everyone. Thanks for being with us. Cheers. Bye, guys. Thank you.